Good morning. Uh, my name is Ed Montgomery. I'm the Dean of the McCord School of Public Policy, uh, and I want to welcome you to this uh, event on uh, data for the social good. Um, we at McCourt uh, have a long history of uh, being involved with empirical work and analysis of policies and thinking about what works and what doesn't work and how does society operate. Uh, but we're in a different age, at a new frontier, where there's data coming from all kinds of different sources that we never might have imagined. Whether you're thinking about information from uh, uh, cell phones, whether it's information from Twitter and uh, the internet, whether it's text data, whether it's sensor data, uh, we're being inundated with data, uh, which uh, other sectors of the economy have been using for commercial purposes. Uh, we've seen some of it used in law enforcement and other areas. The use of that data for public policy, for thinking about questions of social good, for thinking about questions of access to markets and opportunities for underserved populations is a relatively new area. It's an area that we very much think uh, should be explored and needs to be explored, partly because we're a policy school, but partly because of our values of the institutions that we stand for. Uh, the Catholic Jesuit mission of Georgetown University talks about serving the common good. Our students come with a sense of drive of wanting to make the world a better place. Uh, domestically, internationally, that's part of our DNA. And so thinking about how to use this kinds of information for the common good is something that we, we see as a part of our DNA. And so we're building uh, something that we're calling the Massive Data Institute. Uh, it's not the Big Data Institute. It's even bigger than the ma that. And so we're doing massive data uh, to think about that intersection between society, public policy, and new types of information, and how do we use that kind of way to serve uh, the public good. We all know some of the challenges about using this new information. Legitimate privacy concerns, government intrusion, people worried about unintended consequences, discrimination, uh, being, data being used uh, to lock you out of health care. So the question is, as we think about this new information, how to think about both those risks, how to manage those risks, how to manage those dangers while still opening up uh, that information uh, to think about the future, to think about how to make life better, to make uh, people who are isolated, uh, make them part of the, the mainstream uh, to, to serve communities that perhaps have been left out in the past. We're very, very privileged to be uh, partnering with the, the Beck Center, uh, who is uh, the campus's leader in innovation and thinking about policy, thinking about making societal changes in different kinds of ways. And Sonal Shaw uh, is uh, a, a real uh, gem for us uh, to have and a privilege to get to work with her. Uh, none of this could have happened without Holly Gilman, who's just walking in front of me. Uh, you know, Holly, let's give Holly a, a round of applause. is really the, the, the person who deserves all the credit for pulling uh, all of us together. We're bringing you here today largely because we want to hear about where we could be most useful. What is the space? What's the intersection? Some of you are from data people, sources, have control of data, have data that you've got from your companies in a variety of ways. Some of you serve, are from nonprofit organizations who serve under uh, represented communities or isolated communities or uh, issues of, of the public good. Uh, some of you are re researchers. Uh, some of you are at the open government at different uh, federal, national, or state level, uh, city level. Uh, and so this is an, it should be an interesting mix, an interesting conversation. And what we're trying to get is an agenda, suggestions about what could we go where can we go forward? What should we try, try and do? What are the partnerships that we can try and construct? The MDI is very much built on a partnership model. It'll be a partnership across the campus between social scientists and computer scientists, uh, between natural scientists, people in the humanities. It'll be a partnership broader than that, thinking in, bringing in statistical agencies, other people who hold data, private companies, uh, et cetera, NGOs, all of them, because uh, we realize we don't have all the expertise, we don't have all the questions, and the issues are too important uh, to put ourselves in, in stovepipe. So that's what today's conversation is about. Uh, with that, I'm going to begin the, the, the process, and I want to first to introduce our first speaker, Karen Gornblue. Uh, Karen uh, is a, a, a longtime colleague. Uh, she is currently the Executive Vice President of External Affairs at Nielsen. Before that, she was the U.S. Ambassador to the OECD. She's uh, worked uh, on the Hill as uh, uh, first in the Senate, 
for John Kerry, uh, then President Obama. Uh, she served in the Obama administration, clearly. She also served in the Clinton administration at the FCC and at the Treasury. Karen really has worked on technology issues from both inside and outside of the government, and we couldn't be happy to have her to give us uh, her diverse perspectives on the issues that we're confronting here today. So I'd like to call Karen up and the first panel also to join her on, on stage. Karen? Bring that mic way down. Uh, so, so thank you so much, Dean Ed Montgomery and the Beak Center for Social Impact and Innovation. Um, I just think it shows such foresight of Georgetown to have created this new center. And I just want to tell you a little bit why. Um, in this political season, I think what we're witnessing is so much frustration on the part of the American people with their institutions generally and especially with government. And one of the reasons certainly is that they know that while as consumers, they have so much power in the little phone that's in their pockets. But as citizens, they feel powerless. Um, here in Washington, if you go to the mall and you see those big block buildings, it's a symbol, I think, of how people feel about their government, that it's centralized, it's opaque, it's um, top down, it's rigid. And um, it measures its impact by inputs, not by outcomes. It's completely different from the edge-driven, innovative, lean startup culture of the digital age, and people feel that it's really not working. And I think the academy has a critically important role to play in addressing this problem and rethinking what government needs to be about and what the civic sector needs to be about in this age. Academics helped, after all, to develop the theories of progressivism, the New Deal, deregulation, and now we need new theories, clearly. And you couldn't have anyone better to lead this effort than Sonal Shaw. I worked with Sonal years ago at Treasury. I've followed her as she's become an incredible leader in this space, and she's brought together a stellar team, including Dan Carroll, who's been a leading innovator in government and politics. Um, and I think one of the, the great insights that you have is that data should be central to the new approaches. And despite all the, the talk about big data or massive data, um, there's nothing new about data. So I work now I work for Nielsen, which is a 90-year-old company. They invented the idea of market share. They do market research. So data's been around. I think what's really new is that because we live our lives online, so many things are now available in digital form, and machines can read that data, and they can pre-digest it for us and help us make decisions. Um, so it's a little bit easier to act. And this is what we need to use data for in the government and the civic sector. Now, a key role of government has always been about data. The census is in the Constitution because it's such a critically important function of government. The economic report of the president was designed to really put the responsibility for job creation in the hands of the president. I worked at the OECD. I used to call myself the ambassador to data. Um, the OECD was created after one person laughed. <laughs> The, so the OECD was created um, after World War II as a, um, a part of the Marshall Plan to get the countries in Europe, and then later it expanded to include other developed countries, to cooperate through sharing data in part. And that data allows them to learn from each other and to name and shame each other when they're not doing things that they want to do. The IMF, the World Bank, these have allowed a lot of macroeconomic uh, decision making through data. Now, there's been a lot of innovation in the use of data over the recent years, but it's focused on open data. So President Obama's first executive action was to require that agencies in the federal government make their data available, and that's allowed incredible innovation uh, from third parties. Um, and then there are other efforts, like Code for America, that have helped local governments better collect data and improve service delivery. So finding and filling pothold is an often uh, cited example where people will use their cell phones to document you know, where there are potholes and government has that information and they can go out and figure it out. But the next frontier is, I think, what people want to talk about today, which is how do we use data to measure and improve citizens' lives? And that's really hard. It's really hard work. It seems like it's not objective somehow when you think about what you're going to measure and at what level of governance. And so I think figuring this out is going to require political will, it's going to require smarts, and it's going to require capacity. Um, and I, we'll talk about this later, but by only measuring certain things, we're making decisions today, we're just not admitting it. And uh, now that we can, 
we, we need to measure the outcomes we're trying to achieve and match them against the appropriate input. So an example is in, in education. What do we usually measure? We measure the number of teachers, the number of students, the uh, graduation rates, the dollars spent. But what does that mean? Well, one of the innovative things that the OECD has done, and I think this is the reason this study is on the front page of the New York Times every other year when it comes out, are the PISA results for education, where they measure what are students actually learning, 15-year-olds, uh, in science, math, and reading across countries. And it's allowed incredible learning by countries of what other countries are doing and they've improved and um, it's been an incredibly valuable effort. But uh, it raises a lot of political issues. It's In the US, it's available at the wrong level because it's a, available at a country level and we make decisions at a much more local level. So there are efforts to get PISA for schools now so that parents will have the information at the level at which they can take political action. Um, in, in a country like South Africa, they didn't have the data, so they couldn't participate in something like PISA. So I think this raises a lot of the, the questions about how do you get the right kind of data, but, it, but once you get it, it's really valuable. Another example is in healthcare, where we were all moaning 10 years ago that uh, we all were measuring and paying for um, uh, um, procedures in healthcare and not health outcomes, and that's changed a lot with Obamacare and promises to revolutionize healthcare. Um, so Nielsen has been working a little bit on uh, glo the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development data, which is this new effort that the UN Foundation and the State Department have launched to try to get better data to get the sustainable development goals uh, working. And I think that'll be a real challenge and it'll be very interesting. And I think that effort will benefit from a lot of the work that's done here. Those are just a few examples, but I know that the the Beak Center is going to really give us all, all new ways to understand how data can be used to reform government and the civic sector to make it responsive to citizens' needs in the new era. I think they're going to help us build the capacity, build the political will, certainly build the smarts. And I know I'm excited to be here and looking forward to the discussion. So thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us look around in this audience and it's great to see so many faces that have been really integral collaborators. So I want to thank you guys for coming out today for what I hope will be a really interesting and exciting discussion. A few quick thank yous. Um, these events always look flawless and that is, uh, that is not true. <laughs> I want to thank Yvette and Lauren and Crystal and Hannah and Sonal and the Beck Center for all of their help. So a quick round of applause for them. And I hope that we can really engage all of you in a discussion today because one of the fun things about being at a university is the opportunity it allows us to think creatively about these issues. I am truly honored to be sitting with these people, some of the best and the brightest, really thinking about how data can be applied for all of us in our lives. So they're gonna kick it off with a few sort of introductory remarks about how they're thinking about data in their respective fields. And then we're gonna have a discussion and then we're gonna open it all up to you. So the first person is Brian Rich from the Hive Project at the UN Refugee Agency. Thank you, uh, good morning. So um, I run a special project of the UN Refugee Agency focused on getting more Americans to care about and become involved in some capacity uh, to help address the global refugee crisis. And uh, there are a couple, there are a number of challenges uh, related to that, um, more and more each day, it seems. But uh, one of the big ones is, uh, if you look at the United States, we are a uh, woefully underperforming market uh, in terms of both political and philanthropic participation. Um, uh, maybe 10 million people in the United States actively give to NGOs. Uh, there are more who give to charity anonymously and things of that nature, but the amount of money that we've raised out of the United States to help uh, any uh, social cause or issue is only about 2% of GDP, and that number has been largely flat for the last two or three decades. We also have, as we all know and have talked about probably many times in other settings, uh, you know, a very limited number of people who participate in the political process, uh, participate in the democratic process at a local level or at a national level. So the High Commissioner and the Deputy High Commissioner uh, look at the Global Refugee Challenge and look at the fact that the United States is the largest uh, financial supporter of refugee relief 
operations around the world and the largest uh, host nation resettler or committed to resettling of all nations around the world. And uh, you know, we're barely scratching the surface of what is possible and what is needed. So they said, you know, figure out how to get more Americans to care and become involved. Um, when we did our you know, polling and we looked at all of the, the things, we saw an overwhelming amount of support for refugees uh, generally and an American role uh, taking a leadership action in that. We saw slightly less support for resettlement, but in general, you know, Americans are good people and want to help. Um, the problem is, is nobody will get off their couch and do anything. Um, and no amount of, you know, NGO, traditional cry and buy, hope and horror, sort of let me tell you a story about someone who fled violence or persecution or, you know, a child who has been, uh, you know, set up with a wonderful educational experience in, in a camp is going to penetrate the general American perspective. So we came at this as uh, part political campaign, part consumer brand, part tech and media startup. Uh, in, invested in all of the same sophisticated data modeling capacity that the Obama campaign had and the target uses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have a full-time data scientist uh, on staff, which is probably the only NGO that has that in terms of focus on engagement and activation. Um, and now we're trying to figure out you know, how to get people to uh, get off the couch and take action. And, and here's the, the two data challenges that I would sort of put out, um, and then I'll stop. One is, you know, we have this incredibly sophisticated data, but it's only through the lens of uh, what's going to motivate someone to care about uh, the refugee crisis or some issues that relate climate change, bullying, things of that nature. Um, but we're not looking at the relatively small audience or even those who are lookalike models of that relatively small audience of people who are likely to support a social cause. We're looking at what we call the other 300 million people in the country who are consumers and spend a lot of time and a lot of money on other things, uh, unlikely that we would be able to move them to become do-gooders, totally possible that we would be able to bring aspects of the global refugee crisis into a totally different frame and get people to take action accordingly. Um, for that to happen, we need to understand people much better on a consumer level. We can't do that alone with the data that we have. So when we go to corporations, instead of saying, please give us an insufficient amount of money to solve the global refugee crisis, could you actually help us get smarter and engage consumers at a much more sophisticated level? And they sort of pat us on the head most of the time and say, you know, it is really great that you're trying hard to solve a global complex problem. Maybe I can raise some awareness for you. Instead of thinking of us as a sophisticated political consumer media tech operation and going, wow, you know, if Uber came to me and had all of their data, or if Hilton came to me and had all of their data, I'd be like, hmm, what can I do with that? We need to be thought of in that way, and we need to work with uh, sophisticated consumer-oriented organizations. And then the second problem is the NGO sector as a whole, which talks about modeling and talks about data, but really only does two things, which are basic analytics. How much money did we raise? Not enough. Uh, and the you know, we're engaging everybody who cares in the country, which is still just look like modeling of the same maybe 10 million people in the country, and we're all cannibalizing each other. Um, so in some respects, that's a data challenge, but I'm not a data scientist. I'm an engagement comms uh, behavior person. Um, but it is a data challenge, because without the data, we're not going to get smarter, more effective, and we're not going to solve what I would consider to be probably one of the you know, largest, most significant uh, problems in the world, which is the global refugee crisis. Um, so, you know, help us figure that out. Fantastic. Thank you, Brian. I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Flowers from 538. Um, thank you uh, for having me here. Um, uh, my name is Andrew Flowers. I'm the quantitative editor at 538. 538.com uh, is a news website uh, owned by ESPN and ABC News. Uh, we've grown from two people at the New York Times, uh, Nate Silver and Michael Cohen, to now about 40 people. We cover politics and sports, uh, but also economics, science, lifestyle, and other subjects. Um, we consider ourselves a data journalism organization, and I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that. Um, and my role on the site is two parts. One, I write mostly about economics and sports, but then I also help with the kind of back-end data science work for all our writers. I vet uh, the journalism, not for the pros, but for the methodology, the data analysis. Now, what do we have to do with data for social good? The reason for this uh, convening. Take a step back, uh, and not to sound too high-minded, but let's just take journalism writ large. 
at its best, journalism is, a, is you know, a force for social impact and hopefully social good, right? You're presenting information, you're, uh, you're doing reporting, you're um, uh, telling stories that hopefully spur change. Okay, uh, and, and I don't mean this just in the kind of, you know, uh, holding power accountable sense like Watergate, but also something more granular and very human. Like last year, the Pulitzer Prize for a, um, Public Service went to a, a small South Carolina paper that wrote about domestic violence in the state. So that's journalism at its best. It, it doesn't always live up to those ambitions, though. But 538 is a data journalism organization. Now, what do I mean by that? One of the shorthand ways we, uh, we define data journalism um, it, it is social science on deadline, or empirical social science on deadline. <laughs> now, let me walk that back, because we're not claiming we're the equivalent of, of an economist or a sociologist or a political scientist, not at all. But to what extent can we write stories about the news that involve original data analysis that can maybe get you 80% of the um, bang for the buck of an of a academic approach, but in only 20% of the time? That's kind of like what I would define as data journalism. And, and, and that has pitfalls, and it's hard. And um, it, it, again, it's not a replacement for this uh, sophisticated academic type work. But data journalism can thus have a really important impact for social good. So if journalism as a whole is doing reporting and telling stories, what's the role for data journalism specifically? So that's what I want to talk about. Um, uh, what are the kind of main takeaways I found in the kind of two years at 538 for ways that you can amplify our data journalism, our work, um, to, again, make a, a positive impact, uh, to spur, you know, uh, to, to create social, social good? Um, so there's three takeaways I have. Um, and they're going to move from the most technical to the most kind of human and least technical. And actually, as I go along, it's going to get more difficult. And that's one of the, I think, important takeaways here is that this is not just a technical engineering problem. It's actually much more complicated. So the first most technical is sharing data. So beyond just writing data journalism stories, one of the things I think I'm, I'm really proud of us is that on our GitHub page, and GitHub is this kind of data and code sharing platform, github.com slash 538. What we do is for hundreds of stories, or dozens of stories, uh, I'll correct myself, we've presented, hey, here's a link to the story, but the underlying analysis, here's the raw data, here's our code, here's uh, you know, ways that you can reproduce this. And so this is not just a, a way to hold us accountable to make sure that you know, we've shown our work, so to speak, that we're transparent. It's also a way to amplify our work, because a lot of times you would, you would not believe uh, we're having kind of uh, people who are enthusiastic open source uh, data scientists and developers taking our work and then building off of it. And that's, that's really incredible. Um, that involves, you know, I hope, hopefully we set an example for other academics and policymakers and other organizations that do uh, uh, data science work um, and that they not only just release the data, it's one thing to, you know, make sure your data is open, that's great. But and this leads me to my second point, which is a little less technical, but again, more challenging, is documentation. And so one of the things we're proud of, not just on our GitHub page, but in our actual storytelling, is that we have both uh, a clear explanation for how we go about our analysis, not just to allow for reproducibility, but to allow people to understand data. And that's the hardest, that, what I, when I think of a bottleneck, it's, again, it's not an engineering or a technical expertise bottleneck, it's how can we communicate and break down silos? That's one of the things I think we're gonna talk about here. And the way to communicate and break down data silos between, say, government agencies in Washington, for example, is not just that they share the data and release it, but that there's an actual clear explanation and kind of a universal data model, a schema, for how to interpret it. So what do we do? We put out you know, lots of documentation with our data and, and, and within our stories, too. Now, the third part about this, how do you really amplify our work, or, and, and what are the broader takeaways for anybody who wants to kind of amplify their data work for social good, is find a data hook. Find a, an actual engaging story to tell, because this, and this is the most difficult, is that it's not just about releasing the data and letting it run free and, and, and saying, look at this really sophisticated you know, code I wrote. That's not going to get you that far. You have to actually write about things that are either not written about because of the underserved communities that uh, just either journalists or academics or policymakers don't really address their issues. And we try to do that. And I can talk more about the stories we've done in those domains, like such as uh, 
where police officers have killed Americans uh, throughout the U.S., releasing that data. We did a story this weekend about uh, the rise of um, uh, uh, terrorism in France and the EU off the Paris attacks. Uh, we ha uh, have data on college earnings and uh, returns to different college majors. We have data on police residency requirements, on the abuse of prescription drugs by baby boomers, and I can go on. And we have lots of fun stuff, too. We don't take ourselves too seriously. We do a lot of baby names and NFL predictions as well. Um, <laughs> So the, the lessons here, as I wrap up, are threefold. One, share your data. Put it out on GitHub. Share your code. Put it out on GitHub. That's technical, but that's actually the, the least challenging of the three problems. Second of all, explain what you did. And that's very hard. It, release your documentation. That begins to trigger a cascade of, of open source passion, of enthusiasts that can break down the data silos. And third, find a data hook. Tell a human story. Provoke engagement. Um, Zach Markovitz from What Works Cities. Great, thanks. Uh, it's really exciting to be here. Um, I'm Zach Markovitz. I'm the director of city programs for What Works Cities. Um, so I'll go a little bit about sort of what we do, and then we'll get into the discussion after that. But um, so What Works Cities is a new initiative. Um, about five organizations coming together, funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies, um, and with the goal of working with 100 mid-sized cities. Um, across the U.S. to help them use data and evidence better to drive decision making and ultimately to improve the lives of residents. Um, and so we're talking about 100 mid-sized cities. So this is, uh, we define it as cities between 100,000 and a million people. And uh, the reason why we focus on mid-sized cities is uh, in the research that sort of went around building this initiative, there was really an unmet need, I think both of you sort of touched on this a little bit, for um, how cities can, uh, how cities of this size can begin to take the um, data that's collected at the sort of the front line level and have it tied to really key strategic priorities that are set by mayors, city managers, city councilors, leadership, and city government, and make that something that's tangible in order to uh, sort of systematically reach towards goals uh, to accomplish outcomes that improve um, residents' lives and improve um, municipal government in general. And we've you know, you look at a lot of the best practices that are coming out of you know, New York and Chicago and LA, and they have lots of resources out there, but it's in other cities around the country, in the Jackson, Mississippi, uh, Mesa, Arizona, um, Kansas City, Missouri, which are not there, and are also doing incredible work, um, but uh, are looking for the, how they can take that first step in taking all the information that you collect on a data, data level, um, on education, on roads, on uh, blight and housing and homelessness, and make it actionable. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, so I said there's five partner groups working with cities around the country. Um, and so uh, we have partners at the Sunlight Foundation who are doing really amazing work with a young mayor, Tony Yarber, in Jackson, Mississippi, um, helping them uh, not only pass an open data policy, the first of its kind for a city, but also do the legwork behind it in order to uh, build up a data inventory, a governance model, and really set that, that uh, city forward uh, on a path towards um, making that data actionable. Our colleagues at the uh, Johns Hopkins University Center for Government Excellence are doing really, really incredible work with a lot of cities, but um, in Kansas City, Missouri, relatively advanced city in, in using their data, but they have this citywide business plan in which they're looking to have it trickle down a cascade into departments so that you know, individual frontline workers can see how their day-to-day -day efforts can affect the, the city goals at the end of the day. Um, the uh, Behavioral Insights team is a, a sort of a new, uh, new initiative here in, in the U.S. Uh, helping to work with cities on low, we call low-cost evaluations. So you don't have to wait to the end of a two, four, six-year randomized control trial to figure out whether a program is performing or underperforming or not performing at all, but you can nudge programs along the way, do tweaks and figure out exactly how can we uh, deliver better services midstream uh, and make those course corrections. Uh, and doing some work in, in New Orleans and, um, and uh, uh, Louisville along that lines. And then um, at the Government Performance Lab at Harvard Kennedy School, we're going to studies on how do you tie procurement and contracting to outcomes. Uh, so that you're not just renewing contracts year after year, um, but you can work collaboratively, um, like in the city of Seattle, um, uh, addressing homelessness. Uh, many of you may know they just declared this um, state of emergency on homelessness. Um, how do you work collaboratively, contractors, um, grantees, and cities to uh, achieve better outcomes um, to the goals that you're trying uh, to reach? So. Fantastic, thank you. And 
our final panelist, Laura Quinn from Catalyst. Uh, well, thank you, Holly. Thank you, Ed, um, and your team for what you're building here, but um, and also for this conversation. Um, so uh, my name is Laura Quinn. I'm the CEO of Catalyst, which is a data enterprise that was founded just under 10 years ago. And what we provide is we compile a database of the full voting age population of the US. So we maintain consistently uh, about 240 million individual person records. And then we try to append and enrich all of those records with information about people's civic participation and civic behavior. And we provide access to that data to progressive organizations, which includes hundreds of organizations that are working in the political arena, campaigns, those kind of political parties, um, but also uh, not-for-profits, issue advocacy, advocacy organizations, think tanks, increasingly universities, um, other foundations that are doing research around civic engagement and, um, and advocacy. So we're a lot like the large commercial data compilers like Experian or Axiom who are compiling people's commercial behavior. They're collecting all of those swipes and all of those payments and all of those times that you're online and you're shopping in order to be able to better understand you as a consumer and understand what you might purchase next um, and how to talk to you really meaningfully about shopping. Um, <laughs> What we're trying to do is, and you know, have a long-term relationship with you um, <laughs> in terms of your shopping. What we're trying to do uh, is compile um, a set of information that helps us understand people uh, in the way that they interact with their democracy, and how they participate, and what they care about, and what kind of actions are meaningful to them. And then the organizations we work with use that to hopefully try to talk to people um, about the way that they are thinking about their government or they're thinking about um, the way that they're represented, they're thinking about who can best represent them and all the other kinds of ways that um, people hopefully are thinking and participating in, in this democracy. So one of the things, I'll, I'll give you just a few observations from 10 years of doing this work now that I think are instructive. And then I'm very interested in this conversation and the people in this room because um, I think that the attention around the use of, de of data for the purposes of civic engagement and issue advocacy and even governing um, is lagging far, far behind what's happening on the corporate side around shopping. Yep. Um, and that's a bit tragic. And I do think that you know, greater engagement across disciplines around how to accelerate the use of data for some of the purposes that my fellow panelists just outlined is of critical importance. Um, I think that uh, one of the observations I'll um, share with you is that when this kind of data sort of came in large measure into the political space, the easiest things to ma measure are tactical. You know, everything becomes a question of how to make the work you're doing a little bit more efficient. Mm -hmm. So the data is immediately trained on questions of efficiency. Um, but that sort of begs the question of what, are, what is the nature of the problems that we should be solving for? Uh, is that a question, are, are all of our questions about improved efficiency? Or do some of the questions that we want to solve for um, uh, are they measures of something different? And that's very difficult because efficiency is often easily measured in the form of dollars. Um, and if we make the data purely in service to those types of questions, we're going to end up with you know, one set of policies and activities. So there's a creative or a less quantitative uh, exercise that has to happen on the front end of any use of data, which is, what is the problem that we're trying to solve for? And then you bring the data scientists and the data to bear, and they can add a lot to helping to solve that problem. But are we asking the right questions? So that's, so that's one thing. And in the political space, it, often being more efficient in your advertising is less important than being persuasive in your advertising. I'll tell you that in the political space, nobody wants to put a dollar back in their pocket. Hmm. 
You know, they're willing to mortgage their house and their children to win a campaign. <laughs> so the, the efficiency question is less important than the am I actually moving people, persuading them, causing them to change their view of the world or their view of their government. Um, so that's just one example of what I mean by are we solving for the right questions before we're bringing the data to bear. And then on the other side of the equation, I'll say that um, I was uh, 10 years ago uh, had been in uh, the you know on the hill and in the White House and lots of different places in this city, and I was a huge advocate of bringing more quantitative um, methodologies to bear inside a space that seemed to be a little bit lacking in that. Um, now I'm tilting a little bit back in the other direction. There's been such a fascination, at least in the political and advocacy space, with data and with new quantitative approaches, that sometimes we lose sight of the fact that it has to be blended with qualitative understandings mm -hmm. that are not easily contained in the data. Um, interpreta interpretation of data is, there's a great deal of subjectivity that is part of that. So compiling the data, an engineering exercise, interpreting the data, not always as completely quantitative as we would like to imagine that it is. Um, and in that respect, I often um, talk about the kinds of models that are being built in the political space right now that are look-alike models. Give me a model that tells me who, my, who are likely to be like my the supporters that I have already, for example. The databases themselves so far don't include as much of the granular nuance to mm. capture all of the interesting ways that um, humans behave. Mm. I mean, I know there's some folks from Google in the room. You know, that may be changing and it may be you know, in the future, something that is, in fact, more even more uh, able to be attacked from a quantitative pr point of view. But right now, there still is a lot of sub subjective interpretation that needs to happen. So bringing the quantitative uh, scientists together with the qualitative scientists to create the right context for the way that da data is interpreted on the back end um, is, I think, another very important um, uh, consideration. And the, and the one last, uh, yeah. just the one other thing that I see is, in, at least in the political space and in the governing space, there's a lot of data that's assembled for the purposes of this campaign or this issue fight. Um, there's less longitudinal data. Um, you know, with the exception of the census, many of these other data sources are not being built to understand change over time. Um, and people's condition when they're participating in one way versus their condition, you know, several years later when, they're, when their um, participation is changing. So that longitudinal aspect, I think, is very important. And we, from our point of view, we have been compiling data longitudinally very aggressively since the start, and we are now seeing the ability to look back over a decade of participation understood at the person level as opposed to the geographic level. And we are, in fact, seeing... Um, uh, n new insights and, new, and better ability to predict where people are going in the future because we can see better how they have changed in the way that they're participating and interacting over time. So I think those are a few observations and um, I, I hope that uh, the people in this room are all going to sort all those all of these problems out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, let's just do a quick round of applause for these great introductory remarks. Um, I think you guys uh, now all see why I'm so excited to have this discussion. I think, uh, you know, Karen's comment actually became sort of an overarching theme of what I'm hearing, which is this tension between how we think about the consumer versus the citizen. And where we see consumer data, consumer analytics, that's the stuff that we see in our lives or we don't see. Sometimes it's invisible, but it's there and we understand how to use it. And then the people up here are thinking about a very different conception of how an individual relates to the state and where data can play a role in that. And so each of the panelists in their own capacities are thinking about this question. How do we actually take data and translate it into improved policy outcomes? And you know, as Andrew mentioned, this question of silos and to Laura's point about why we don't see more longitudinal data and looking holistically at an individual, I think these questions are actually related. So I want to, you know, jump back in. Andrew, do you want to sort of kick it off about how to think about this? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so on the issue of, of data silos, I think, you know, this is something um, uh, 
we're struggling with. And by we, I mean users of data trying to interpret the, the different schemas from using Census Bureau longitudinal data to uh, uh, it, you know, department specific uh, data sets from data.gov or whatever. And <clears throat> one way to think about how to overcome it, it's not a panacea by any means, but is pushing for open data actually starts within the agencies that are trying to use it. So I've heard DJ Patel, the White House Chief Data Scientist, joke about how when a new data set is released on data.gov, there, there's all these, or there's an API where you can kind of access a certain agency's data that they put on their website. There's all these, these hits from it initially, and they're like excited that the public's using it. And it's actually other people in the building. And it's, it's actually like other people in the agency realizing, oh wow, thank, thank goodness <laughs> that the public pressure to oh, release our data yeah. um, to anyone facilitates the use of it internally. Um, so if we can generalize that, if across different departments and agencies within such a big bureaucratic organization as like the federal government uh, of the United States or the UN or whatever, pushing for that data to be released publicly um, is going to uh, facilitate users within it to understand, okay, we need to make this more standardized. Um, that's one way to think about it. Another uh, additional point I, I will add to this issue of data silos, uh, uh, one way to approach, one way to really spur change is um, through Freedom of Information Act requests. So this is a kind of a, a specific journalist uh, uh, lens at it, but anyone can submit a FOIA request. But uh, p pushing agencies to release their data through FOIA requests actually in the end triggers them to just say, let's just put this online and not to deal with the, it's just a pain <laughs> in the ass. If, if people are constantly asking for this data, and they have a right to it, and you, there's initial uh, fear that needs to be overcome, but once it's out there, it's out there. I'll give you an example. Uh, we did a story about Uber and the New York City taxi cabs. Well, the Taxi and Limousine Commission was very afraid to release trip level anonymized data about taxis to study, like are they serving underserved communities of New York? Are, uh, is Uber taking a, a, a market share from them? Well, it took years of like really arduous FOIA requests to get this data, and then we wrote stories about it, and other people wrote stories about it, and bloggers took the data and did even better work well, at this point, the Taxi and Licensing Limousine Commission just put, puts the data online. They don't, they don't have to deal with this work anyway. So that's my two points would be releasing the data helps break barriers of silos, even just internally, because it, it forces a standard schema. And two, FOIA requests and other pressure. Uh, I know it sounds kind of uh, pit bully, but like it's going to, in the end, make people want to you know, release their data publicly, and, and that'll cycle back. And I, I, would, I would add to this in sort of picking up on Laura, what you said, and I remember when, I remember the pre-catalyst days and the post-catalyst days uh, of political work um, that I was involved in, where um, people within a, a, a shared sector didn't understand the value that came from sharing information. Um, so if you look at the nonprofit space, and you know, we did this, and I'm not a data scientist, so we did this in a very ad hoc fashion where like I took two or three pieces of paper and lined them up next to each other and did some math the way like my <laughs> eight-year-old does math um, where we said you know fundamentally if you de-duped all of the lists of the million and a half nonprofit organizations in the United States and who is donating you would actually find that there are not you know 95% of Americans you would only find about 10 million people um, because I'm on like 37 different lists <laughs> Um, and I'm probably misidentified on a number of those lists because some include my middle initial and some don't, and some, you know, I've moved a bunch of times in my life, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's this fear in the nonprofit community that if they, you know, share their lists, that someone else is going to uh, steal their audience and raise money from them, and then they can't raise money, and then they'll go out of business. Um, First of all, that's a stupid fear because at last check, I don't think that keeping yourself in business as a nonprofit organization is in fact what your mission is supposed to be. I think it's actually supposed to be to solve for whatever the issue is that's affecting the world. So misguided fear in that regard. Um, but also what you'll find if you did dedupe the list and you compared is um, the people who overlap on those lists overlap because for totally legitimate reasons, they care about multiple causes. And the majority of people only care about a limited number of causes or a, or a cause, 
and it's directly tied to something that has nothing to do with the organization or the marketing effectiveness of it. It's because Americans particularly, but people in general, are very self-interested. And I don't think we're going to get to the point where we can flip this idea of how to look at humans and the behavior that they take and how to influence that behavior in at least, you know, in my context, what I would argue is a constructive capacity. I would argue uh, the same is true for participation in democracy. Politics can easily be seen not as a constructive way, but it is ultimately about the democratic process. Until we get past the basic market challenge of the competition um, and, and people realizing that the thing that makes you successful is not because you hoard data, it's because you're smarter than the other organizations about how to use whatever intelligence you have. So I would just put the challenge to this group that I don't think the idea of siloing is actually a data challenge. I think it's a market challenge. And we need to come up with a way to uh, demonstrate the value that participating in a shared data environment offers. Mm -hmm. um, and use the census as an example, right? The Constitution mandates that we have a census. Uh, they don't have to compete with anybody. They just have to get the entire population to participate, which is a monumental challenge unto itself. But at least they're focused on that challenge and not the challenge of being like, hey, uh, you know, apartment owners of the world, will you, you know, please let us know where people live? Like, they've eliminated that set of problems because they have a constitutional mandate to do it. I don't know that we can get a constitutional anything to mandate that people should share their information, but at least we should be out there saying, you know, you're still going to be able to raise your money and convert your voters and sell your stuff uh, because you have a product that resonates with certain people but not everybody, so forget the hoarding and, you know, rise above. And I also think on the other side of the market challenge, you would put a lot of crappy things out of business where... I mean, there are just a lot of products that people won't buy and a lot of issues that people just aren't going to support. That doesn't mean they're not important. It just means the market doesn't bear it at the moment. So right. I, think, I think that's right. And I think part of it is, is that it's a political challenge, right? So it's not a Little technical challenge. It's also about how do you marry the technology that we have with the institutions that exist today. I mean, Zach, you must see this on the city level all the time. Well, this is I'm, this is sort of to get to a number of the points, sort of the efficiency, the, the sharing of data. It's, um, it, so yeah, there, there's also this element that it's just making the case about why it's important to share data. People are strapped, especially in local government. You know, as budgets have been cut, people are asking them to do more. Citizens, we, we demand more services from our, our government than ever before and want it on our phones wherever we can get it. Um, and so these silos oftentimes come up and the sharing of data um, becomes just another burden um, as opposed to just doing my job and getting it done, um, where the efficiencies that can be gained from when you open up a data set and you find that the most people who are downloading it are the people in the department next door, the person at the desk next door to you who didn't know that you were collecting it to begin with, <laughs> um, is something that's extremely valuable and it's a case that is resonating, I think, as people are digging deep. I think these silos we're looking at them, they exist in, in this context in a number of different ways. I mean, the most fundamental is that there's just like this technological challenge of old legacy systems where it's just whole data and just it's hard to get it out of them. That can be done at an individual level very easily. On a scalable level, it's really, really hard if we're talking about looking at it. Um, there's the department, department stuff um, in terms of making sure that the human services and the police are understanding, they are sharing data in key ways that are reporting up to outcomes. Um, there's the sort of federalism issue, right? You know, local, county, state, uh, making sure they're being shared. Um, I brought up Kansas City before. They have four counties, right? Um, they have an open data consortium that helps that, but there's key data they need to share with each other. Um, uh, and, yeah, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I do. Um, I think I think you're right, but I think we're all underestimating the. There's a there's a very huge cost of creating the foundation upon which a lot of data can be shared. Um, and I think that is a big barrier and why a lot winds up siloed. I mean, in the commercial space, there's a reason why the biggest, richest Fortune 500 company still uses an Axiom or an Experian. Because it's not worth the expense to them of maintaining databases of everyone on a wide variety of foundational information. 
because they're maintaining lovingly information around their set of um, uh, customers or account holders or whatever it is. Just the way the police are you know, aggregating exquisitely a set of data that's relevant to them. But associating it easily with other sets of data is vastly improved when there's a sort of a foundation upon which that can happen. It's almost like, you know, uh, uh, when you have basic, you know, banking structures underneath, that a lot more transactions can happen. It's a little bit the same on the data space. It was once upon the time the case that that foundational structure for a lot of academic research and for policy making was the census data. But the census data, because of uh, restrictions on it and uh, the way that it's compiled, is not potentially adequate to the task any longer to be that foundation of data. What needs to be underneath that allows people mm -hmm. to more quickly associate data is a much more robust foundation. Those foundations are being built in the, on the commercial side. I mean, the, the capacities that exist now in some of the large data corporations, I won't name anybody, the folks in this room can stand up and say, that's us. <laughs> um, but that is missing, you know, for associating all of these rich pockets of data in an easy way and in a way that makes sense longitudinally over time. Um, people, you know, can aggressively get together and put data sets together mm -hmm. right now and come up with amazing things for the short term. But if we're really attacking this problem, we need to put that underpinning underneath. And if it doesn't come from the government, if it doesn't come in, in some form with a sort of expanded new form of the census, is it going to happen in academia? There has to be a place for that to And we're going to get occur. new silos. I mean, my, my question, right, we're going to get new silos, which my, my fear in this whole data for social good conversation is that we have this robust consumer data set that everyone sees a market incentive to be a participant in. And then we have this significantly less robust because you know we're, we're dealing with grants and you know cities and things that uh, haven't seen the financial and market incentives to be involved yet. So we're going to have another robust system that looks at other things as if the 280 you know million adult consumers in the United States are you know different than the people who request city services and the people who participate in the democracy. Like. There's a, there's a fixed, though growing, number of human beings who live in the United States. Why it is that we treat social good-related activities as a special class of human as, just, as opposed to just mm -hmm. another set of, I'll use the word consumer, but little c consumer behaviors, like voting is a transaction, requesting your uh, drain you know, outside of your home to be unclogged to avoid flooding in your neighborhood is a transaction, the same there's way as requesting an Uber is a transaction mm -hmm. that should be, in theory, associated with the individual citizen. Right, exactly. And so why we differentiate those, I think that is a perception problem. And I was, I mean, I was saying to folks, uh, and I joked about it when I started, but you know, corporations say that they want to help solve these complex problems. They, of course, support democracy and things of that nature. But they don't treat those of us in the social good space as uh, equals. They think philanthropy is like a nice to have in the world. And what I'm saying is like the kinds of sophisticated individual modeling data that we have around refugees will help you sell more stuff. So if we have information that would help you sell more stuff and you have information that would help us engage more people and solve a complex problem in the world, it's a win-win. So, but we don't even have the, we don't have a common rhetorical platform from which to build a data sharing conversation, let alone the technical sophistication or a government supported schema on which all this could. We're literally talking about different languages where they think like, yeah, voting's okay, but like, I'm not gonna make money on it. Or like, refugees, like that sucks, but I can't sell one, so not in my interest. Like, <laughs> no, like the data, it, it's, you know, it's tied to the individual, right? It's universal. We're missing the rhetorical platform in addition to, I think, the technical platform. 